Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello and welcome to Asia Tech Podcast Stories. My name is Graham Brown. Today we're going to talk about a big part of the tech ecosystem and that's hardware. And to do that, I'm joined by a man with a passion for hardware and passion for growing hardware businesses in Asia and beyond. He's the, one of the founding team members of Apple's global SMB channel and also founder of their first entrepreneurship channel. He's the co-founder of Brink, which describes itself as part incubator, part accelerator, part investment fund, and part awesome. Curious to find out what that's all about. He's the man behind the popular Ask Beta Bay YouTube series and joining us all the way from Hong Kong. It's Bay McLaughlin. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great that you are here because put this into context, Yesterday had a big typhoon descend on Hong Kong. One of the, we had a couple of interviews lined up yesterday. One of the guests, Carl Ellicott, who was based in Hong Kong, had to cancel because all the his part of Hong Kong, the internet connections were wiped out. Everything returned to normal there. Yeah, everything's good. That's that's one of my my big jokes. It's obviously dangerous, but uh, the internet doesn't turn off when it rains. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Life continues, right? But you're not from Hong Kong originally. You moved from. The U.S. San Francisco. Yeah, exactly. Right. I'm originally from the East Coast in Virginia, but I spent about 10 years in the Valley in San Francisco before I moved here. And I've been out here about three and a half years now. Okay. So I want to talk about that part of your story as well. That's a really interesting chapter because there's a lot of questions listeners are going to have about that. But I guess, you know, moving from a place like San Francisco, we'll talk about Apple in a minute. It's pretty so, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Safe. You don't, apart from the odd earthquake every hundred years, you don't get many natural disasters out there. You don't get many. <laughs> I mean, you were from the east coast of the U.S. originally, so you must be used to this all by now. Yeah, the hurricane thing is is pretty straightforward. I mean, thank thank goodness we're in a big city, but uh, I'm used to going without power or water for seven or ten days at a time. That's pretty <laughs> common growing up on the east coast. <laughs> right, you've grown up used to that. Fantastic. Okay, well. Bay, let's talk about a couple of things. Firstly, I want to understand what you do at Brink because that introduction that I gave, the, your words yourself, you know, part incubator, part accelerator, part investment fund, part awesome. Curious to know what that's all about. And also that story about moving from San Francisco from, you know, possibly one of the, well, not possibly, but the world's leading tech ecosystem to Asia. That's going to raise a lot of questions. Let's start with Brink first. What exactly is it that you do there? Sure. So our, our firm is very straightforward. We, we try our very, very best to support hardware entrepreneurship. And sometimes that's connected hardware where you're talking about, you know, Apple watches and wearables to connected cars and connected home. But a lot of the time it's also offline products. And we've realized that the entire physical world is made by a lot of old big companies. We're seeing a real resurgence in this generation of people that want to get their hands dirty again. And the ones that are connecting those devices are actually helping us unlock the world's data, which I, I love to you know, be a little bit uh, polarizing when I talk about the software and big, you know, big data, AI, we all hear about this. However, where does that data come from? It comes from hardware. And I really appreciate everyone's decision to wait for all that data, but we're sitting here in the trenches saying, well, then who's going to make that hardware? Who's going to make that sensor? Who's going to connect the physical world so we can unlock the world's information and then hopefully improve our lives, which is really where you make sense of the data. That's all the software, the algorithms, all the machine learning that everyone talks about. So we're the step before that, and I appreciate all the hype that's out there. But guess what? If you don't get your hands dirty and make the hardware, that future is never going to exist. Mm. So – we have a couple of pieces uh, that we run through. We have our online uh, community and incubator, which is called Enter China. Uh, we recently acquired this business. We've currently got 300 members that you can join uh, for a lifetime membership with other hardware founders and learn. Get all your questions answered on a daily basis. We have our accelerator programs, which I think we'll dive into later. We've got three different programs, our global IoT accelerator, our vertical accelerator and drones. And we have recently announced our project or our Guanxi program, which is a later stage accelerator to help people uh, enter the Chinese market. And then our last kind of main stay is our studio, which is when you have these great ideas, you launch all these great products, you take people's orders, you promise them things. It's really hard to actually make things. Actually, Elon Musk just said that people severely underestimate uh, how hard it is to make one thing versus make a thousand things. Mm -hmm. So manufacturing is so much more challenging than people give it credit for. So we've actually built out our entire own studio in China to help any company that wants to make physical things do it right the first time. Right. Fascinating. What kind of people, 
approach you regarding Brink? Because uh, this is something a subject we're going to come and talk to, can't talk about in the context of the valley and the, the mm. ecosystem there is that, you know, there's this narrative of, you know, two young guys, pair of shorts, sandals, straight out of Stanford, maybe 20 years old, walk into an accelerator, 5 million funding. They'd never had a proper job really in their lives. Right place, right time, good education, very young. Is that the kind of founder that you're looking for and or the kind of founder that turns up knocking at the door of Brink? It, it's, I think that that entire narrative is changing. I mean, just basic stats. If you look at the Startup Genome Report, it shows very clearly that the average age of an entrepreneur is in their late 30s. That's just a fact. Uh, these are people that normally have been in a corporation. Uh, they might have been an entrepreneur working on something innovative inside of that corporation, but they know an industry really deeply. They understand that they can do something better. They leave to go improve something in an industry. They have real knowledge, real expertise, connections into, uh, and then they do something to innovate in that particular field. Now, I think that narrative, uh, which I certainly was a part of pushing for 10 years mm. in San Francisco, uh, the more I look at it, the more I think it's kind of bullshit. And when we look at hardware entrepreneurs, you know, to another kind of polarizing quote I get hit on all the time is, I think software makes you soft. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that this entire idea of building Instagram with your buddies in a basement and creating a multi-billion dollar company is just BS. And this is unfortunately where all the media attention has gone. And the reality is 99.9999999% of companies on earth have to make money. They're made by hard work, selling products, talking to customers, beating the street, hustling and grinding every single day. That's the normal economy. Uh, unfortunately, the Valley's gotten this megaphone for these outsized wins where you can essentially loss lead, burn capital for 10 years, and then one day have this crazy exit. So um, no, that is not the founder we're looking for. Uh, our average founder skews much older than you might expect because the offline economy, the physical world, we have to figure out a way to connect old and new online, offline, east and west cultures. And to do that, generally 18, 22, 23, 25-year-olds don't have enough experience or grit underneath their fingernails to really understand it. It does happen, but we haven't seen that those are the general uh, kind of demographics that end up being fantastic hardware entrepreneurs today. Hmm. That's, that's really interesting because I, I imagine that for a lot of older entrepreneurs who are as you say, in the majority, there's probably an element of self-doubt there as well, isn't it? Because they may feel that, you know, if I'm in my 30s or 40s, that maybe I'm too old to go to an accelerator program because they look at those narratives that come out of the valley and they think, wow, these kids, these bright sparks coming out of Stanford, I'm not one of those guys, right? So that may be a challenge, but it's, you know, if you, what you're saying is the truth, which I believe is that, you know, these entrepreneurs in their 30s and 40s are better because they have this well-rounded life experience, then these people need to know, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, here's the reality too. All the cool ideas in the world don't originate in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so I think this is one of my favorite kind of other sticks here is that the, the whole idea that you have to leave your life behind and go for three months and move your life somewhere is also garbage. Like that is fine. Um, I think we're seeing that there's actually a massive exodus happening in Silicon Valley. We're seeing people leave and go to Austin, Nashville, New York, uh, lots of parts of Europe, obviously the Middle East, Asia. Like we're seeing people being able to make their way in the markets they're in where it's cheaper. There's just as much talent now. There's just as much opportunity. Um, I think that this entire narrative is actually losing a lot of steam. Mm. Let's talk about that in your story, babe, because you were working for Apple in California. So that would have been, it, in many respects, checking all the boxes. Yep. You had everything yep. there, you know, global recognized brands, great startup ecosystem, access to all the kind of startups that you need, you know, working for a yep. company like Apple, you could open doors everywhere. Did you, yep. whilst you were doing this, did you ever have in your mind this idea that at some point you're going to end up in Asia? Absolutely not. <laughs> so I did, tell us a little bit. Let us understand a little bit about what you were doing there and also where was the genesis of the Asia part of your journey? Sure. So, I mean, pretty straightforward. Um, when I left Apple my second time, I did two different tours there and about six years in total. Uh, you're exactly right. Everything was perfect. On paper, I had the number one performing team globally in my vertical at Apple. I had full autonomy, 
all my customers were every VC and every tech firm you ever heard of. So I had unprecedented access, like you said. I was learning like crazy, making the most money I've ever made. Uh, things were good, you know. I was, mm-hmm. I was. Every one of my fam- family and friends were saying, like, "What in the world are you doing? Leaving? I mean, everything is perfect, right? My stock had been outperforming for what eight years running or something. Um, so." Ultimately, it was a personal decision, which I'm actually about to uh, post a blog post on Medium about is, you know, even when things are good, you can still feel stuck. Hmm. And for me, everything was great. And that's what terrified me is that I could see what tomorrow looked like very clearly. You know, I would have been in Cupertino, nice glass office, making a shit ton of money, having an amazing smart people around me. And life would have just been super cruising. And what's wrong with that? that's the worst thing ever. <laughs> like, like, What's that's missing? the last thing I want. Like, I, I have no desire to know what tomorrow brings. That is the worst way for me to live. I can't stand that feeling. Um, and so Asia uh, was not my idea. Funny enough, I ended up getting married to my uh, college sweetheart. We, we took about eight years off, got back together, and uh, she dropped this bomb on me. When we uh, started hitting it off again, she said, so probably a good time before this gets too serious to let you know that I feel like I would really regret not living in Asia for some duration. I was like, Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) And this is just when you were kind of thinking like, Oh man, like maybe this is it. Right. And, uh, ended up being, you know, a lot easier than I anticipated because, you know, I created a consultant firm, consulting firm on the side for myself. So I was making good money again, working on my own terms. I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. (laughs) Right. Like what, what's the difference? I can consult technologies everywhere. Asia is going to be going totally ballistic. Um, and a lot of my good mentors and friends, had started down this road, like, you know, my, my, one of my mentors, Phil Black, he, he was the first investor institutionally in Fitbit, you know, did pretty well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then one of my other good friends, uh, Jason Johnson, the founder of August SmartLock, um, and then you named the list of people that I had access to that were moving into the hardware space. I was like, this is really interesting kind of confluence of events for myself. I get to move to Asia, especially, you know, Hong Kong when it comes to the PRD or the Greater Bay region for manufacturing in China. At the same time, Hardware is really becoming a you know a whole new wave, which it, you know happened in the Silicon Ages in the 60s, 70s, 80s, but had been a long time since hardware was cool. And I had a lot of access, so I was like, okay, you know, let's go do this Asia thing. And, and we just bought one-way tickets and moved here. Wow. So was Hong Kong the natural choice for you? Had you done a lot of? I know you said that, that you had network moving out there, people who had set up. Was it a natural choice? Were there any other options? And how did you arrive at staying in Hong Kong? Yeah, it was it was more of a for, for my wife, you know, her firm. She works in finance, so she had the option between uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, and she mm. had been to both. I'd never been to Asia. I lived in Australia for a while, but I never got up to Asia, and, and so I trusted her instinct. She said, you know, you're not you're not going to really love Singapore. I, I think you're really going to like Hong Kong. And for me, it was really important that I go and get into China as soon as possible and learn as much as I could because I had this feeling that Silicon Valley was severely underestimating the offline operational aspects of building hardware companies, they were just focusing on the nice to have stuff, all the yeah. marketing, the sales, the fundraising. And I was like, you know what? I don't think that's what's killing these ideas. I think it's all the nitty gritty crap work that you have to do in the supply chain that's really blowing these businesses up that should exist. That's, that doesn't seem like rocket science. So uh, Hong Kong is where we started, but I got on a plane immediately. I went to uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Hangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, Myanmar. I, I, I went and traveled everywhere I possibly could uh, to try to put the pieces together. And it seemed to me that Hong Kong was the natural stepping off point for all of Asia, um, and that, or sorry, Southeast Asia and China, and that this is probably the best place as a foreigner to, to feel comfortable and confident with your Western training, mm. but then be able to pop off and be anywhere in a matter of hours. How was that for you? But, you know, you'd come from... Cupertino, where you would have had that nice glass office and, you know, you would have had a business card that would have carried privilege, right? People saw Mm -hmm. Apple, things would have got done. People wouldn't ask you to justify who you are or anything like that. And now you had consciously put yourself in a situation where you had stepped away from a lot of that. I know you carry with you all your learnings and your network and all that, but, you know, you were no longer Apple. You had the background. You were out there on your own. I don't know if you backpacked it there, but you only had a one-way ticket as well. So in, in yeah. a sense, you, you kind of jettisoned a lot of your security. And that's really yep. fascinating to me as, as to why you did that and how you actually felt at that time when you were going into this new market and seeking out, you know, building relationships with China and so on. How did it feel in those early months? 
Yeah, I mean, it definitely felt um, a little weird. You know, you're, you're leaving a place you've been for almost 10 years. Like you said, that network, that credibility, the access. Um, I, I made a conscious decision, and this is something that I also write and talk a lot about, is when you feel like something's wrong, um, I, I have this idea of going into full search mode. And, and to me, that means looking for what's right, not what's next. And this is, there's a lot of what's next in life. There's so much. I mean, and, and everyone has their own responsibilities and, and optionality. So, you, you know, you can take this however it makes sense for you personally. But for me, I had that optionality. I'd done pretty well at Apple. And I realized that I needed to give myself and, you know, Asia time to kind of marinate. So I, I told all my family, friends, my wife, I said, look, I need about a year. And I need to just go out here and I need to hit the ground, rebuild the network, see where, you know, what I learned in the West, what's applicable or what's not applicable. Maybe what I know doesn't mean anything out here. And uh, so I started mentoring at different accelerator programs. I was going to China Accelerator in Shanghai. Uh, I was going to different groups in Thailand and Singapore. And it was funny enough, uh, you know, it, as it generally, I guess, pans out when you get into motion. That's one of my other kind of theories in life is being in motion will actually stir up. The majority of your opportunities, you can't really dictate them by sitting down and writing your to-do list and dreaming. Um, and so when I got here, within three months, I had met my co-founder, my now co-founder in Beijing, and we started working on this idea of Brink, which is obviously you know very small idea back then, almost three and a half years ago. But um, it literally was just by getting on plane rides and going out and going to conferences, going to accelerators, talking to people, it was really clear very quickly that what I had learned in the West, which is a good message for everyone that's listening in the Western you know, part of the world, was actually really revered in Asia. People wanted that mindset. People wanted Western leadership. They wanted the Western way of thinking and approaching the world. Actually, v people are very hungry here mm. to get access to that. So it, you know, I, I told everyone I was going to take a year, and then within three months, I was building a company. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And a lot of what you're saying is very interesting because there's a lot of themes going on there. But there's this core theme that about, to paraphrase, getting off your ass and going and seeing yep. something, yep. Right, which cannot be replaced. And I find that a lot with the startups that I work with is that there is that natural tendency to fall back into a comfort zone behind the computer screen and do the activities which... They're in a way a master of, you know, they're great at coding, mm -hmm. so they stick to coding or they're great at design, so they stick to design. Whereas mm -hmm. what you've consciously done is you've pushed yourself out of that and you've gone and seen things. And you talk about movement as well. I yep. want to explore yep. that a little bit because you, you had this odyssey, I suppose, going around Asia and Southeast Asia, going all these places and visiting mm -hmm. to go and see, which sort of folds into this, I suppose, looking for what's right. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because it sounds like a really important point. I want to sort of dive a little bit deeper into it what exactly were you discovering when you're going out there that you couldn't have done you know if you got yourself a co-working space and sat there for three months i mean the reality is you cannot read a book or a blog post or watch a video on youtube or go see a, a person talk at a conference and actually understand the cultural differences the opportunities you have to come and feel the energy mm. in these markets you have to go like when i just went back to thailand i haven't been to thailand in three years i went back and spoke in texas a couple weeks ago um, and i realized that had i not gone three years prior i wouldn't have understood as much obviously when i got there now and said oh i can really feel the difference in this market after three years or singapore similarly i go back to singapore quite often but i've seen singapore evolve from this software only to now actually having some focus on hardware or you know even in shenzhen like shenzhen three years ago is very different than shenzhen now mm. and i think it's it's one of those things that it, it's really hard to replace like you say get, getting in motion i always believe that I, i'm a surfer by nature growing up on the on the beach that you have to kind of stir up the the sediment and you have to just get moving and that by doing that it's like the storm we just had with the typhoon like this typhoon mixes everything up and you can actually get in motion and like new things are going to now drop into your lap mm. because you're spinning them up. And, and I just don't think that you can generate opportunity or understand something that is, you know, not obvious to everyone else too. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you read the headline, it's too late, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fascinating. And it, um, something that I, I've learned from Apple, I didn't work for Apple, but I have worked with them a number of years on the telecom side of thing is that, you know, a lot of people put Apple success down to all these different factors, which are well known, but people kind of overlook, for example, like the retail mm -hmm. store as key to, you know, what Apple learned from its customers. And that, the whole thing about, I, I think if you look at the Apple genius training manual and dissect that the word empathy 
in that yep. comes up a ridiculous number of times. There's been articles written about this. You can go and Google this stuff, right? You know, the number of times that word comes up and that word empathy really is something that only comes from that face-to-face -face, offline analog touch with mm -hmm. people. And, you know, that's what you, you get by going out there. And as you say, going to these places, you know, you can really appreciate the culture. And you, you can't sometimes put this down in words. It's just like an emotional connection. You understand what that person's feeling. You can kind of, I suppose, like understand the world from their viewpoint as well, rather than from a book. So this is something which, I mean, it's something that fascinates me. And it's something which, you know, from your story as well, it sounds really interesting for a startup entrepreneur to learn you know, to get off their ass, get out there, because you'll learn things. And I suppose in a way, because you were, you know, you had jettisoned a lot of your, your comfort zone, things happen a lot faster. I mean, within three months, you'd mm. found a co-founder. Right? I mean, that's phenomenal right? yeah. to get up and running. Yeah, I think, I think it's also not just for entrepreneurs, people that want to be entrepreneurs. I mean, the reality is that in our lifetime, like if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s right now, maybe 50s and 60s, it wouldn't be as much, but I, I probably, maybe even 50s. The East, you know, in particular, India and China are going to have such a dramatic impact on our lives before we die that if you don't understand this, if you've never been here, you're going to take it full foot, like fully to the face in whatever capacity that they dictate because you don't understand the culture and you're going to get in line. And I really don't think that people understand the scale to which the East is growing and playing globally and all the Westerners, I mean, I'll, I'll paint that very wide brush. All of the West is severely, severely underestimating and certainly doesn't understand what goes on in the East. And all it takes is one flight. I mean, I know people getting flights from New York and San Francisco for under 500 us round trip. You know, you watch three movies, you take a nap and you have a meal and you find yourself in Asia. Yeah. And guess what? All you have to do is go. It's actually we actually created a, a program around China trips. We've now done almost ten of these hosted China trips because I got so sick and tired of going all over the Western world talking about hardware. And I'd ask people in the audience, "Great, raise your hands. Who's been to China?" And less than one percent wow. of the audience have been to China. And I said, "Hold on a second. I'm at a hardware meetup, correct? I'm at a conference about hardware, right?" Are you kidding me? <laughs> and I'm like, what are we talking about? So, so I, I created this program uh, to allow anyone that's serious to, you know, get over here and really try to have their first trip in a more supportive environment. But I mean, shit, man, like China is a hard one. Go, go to somewhere easier. Go to the Philippines to speak English, mm -hmm. right? Go, go to Indonesia and sit in the beach in Bali. It's not that bad, right? Like. You can just but if they want to experience like you, I mean, you, you found your feet in China and Hong Kong, right? It's possible with the right attitude. Absolutely. Well, what do people, uh, you say people haven't, and you talk about the West and experiencing China and so on. What is it that surprises people? I mean, there are obvious things, aren't there? Like, you know, okay, here's the skyline in Shenzhen and look how fast it's changing. These things we know about now. What is it that surprises people that come to China or Hong Kong or any of the markets that you deal with that constantly, I suppose in a way amazes you, you know, if people from the outside come and mm. they're exposed to this culture shock in a way about business yeah. and about technology, hardware and so on. I, I actually think it's more basic than that. I think that as Westerners, we have been trained and there, we have, you know, centuries and generations of training around what we think is right. Hmm. And it's a very like religious based kind of thought process of what's right and what's wrong. And when you come to Asia, it's way different. I mean, maybe even polar opposites, 180 degrees different. And I think as Westerners, most people have a real challenge grappling with the fact that what's right and wrong where they grew up and everyone they've ever known and everything they ever learned in school and their family and everyone may not be the same in a different part of the world. Yeah. And I think that that just foundational like difference is very challenging for most people to reconcile. And this is where, you know, when we talk about, let's say just China and hardware in particular, you know, this idea of protecting your uh, IP or having your contract and the fact that a piece of paper means absolutely fucking nothing <laughs> in China. <laughs> and like this idea of if I'm negotiating with you and I have privileged information that would help me really destroy you, in this particular negotiation, that's not my job to help you understand it. That's your fault for not knowing what I know. Mm. And this is a very different way of approaching it. And I think the West gets quite turned off by it. And the challenge is there's gonna be a lot more people in the East and they're getting more powerful. So this culture is gonna start waving into 
other parts of the West more and more and it's going to become more and more common. This whole Western way of thinking about what's right and wrong, I don't think it's going to last forever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, a culture shock indeed. But that's why you've got to get out there. I remember in Bay myself that I came to Tokyo in 1996. Mm. And I remember walking into my manager's office in Tokyo. And this is where I was starting a new life after college. And I looked at the, the wall on the, in the office and she had this map on the wall, a world map. And we had been used to having you know, the world map centered around that sort of Atlantic Ocean <laughs> with the New York on the left and London on the right. This was completely different. This had shifted. So like the center of the world, that was the Pacific, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, you know, like now where I had lived in the United Kingdom was just like right out in the corner, you know, pushed out into the corner. And it was like a non-entity. And for the first time I saw this and thought, wow, there's something wrong with this map. But then realized hmm. actually this is how they had seen it all their life, right? Yep, and yep. just to see it from those, those things blow your mind. And it's small things, as you say, you know, it's the more mundane things, I guess, that really affect you that you don't sort of like account for. Because, you know, as I say, like the skylines and stuff, you, you've already got your expectations in your head. Yeah, I think I, one of the talks I give is why China matters now. I, I did that at South by this year and I give that talk in a few places. And this is this is a very clear, like top line understanding. So you take the top five markets in the West, top five markets in the East. You've got in the West, you've got, you know, the U.S., the U.K., uh, France, Germany, um, and there's one more I'm missing. I forget where it is. And then you have uh, in the East, you've got China, India, Indonesia, the Philippines and Japan. And you compare the top five in the West versus the top five in the East. It's not 2X or 3X or 4X. There are five times as many humans <laughs> in the top five <laughs> markets in the West, all within a five hour flight versus the top five markets in the East. And I think it's just really, it's just, I think it's just a power dynamic. And I think in the West, we've been trained to be, like you said, so uh, Western centric our whole lives. And uh, I really think that the, anyone that's listening, whether you're an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, uh, just a, an employee that's happy with what they're doing, a government official, an investor, whoever you are, if you are not recognizing that being competitive in our lifetime means actually understanding Eastern cultures, actually understanding the offline economy, actually understanding the old economy and the way of thinking, you're really mistaken. Like you will not be competitive mm. in the next in this next wave if you don't start realizing you have to get out of that local maximum that you're in and thinking that that's all that really is going on in the world. Excellent. That's the that's the stick side of things. That's the kick up the ass that we need. Well, let's talk about the carrot. What is exciting in Asia, and especially in the hardware side of things? What excites you? Because you get to see things before everybody else does. Really, you get mm -hmm. to see what's going on. I know. You, I mean, some of the areas I know that you are interested in, for example, like quantified self. That's something that personally yep. interests me. As yep. a, from the Iron Man side of things, we're always measuring yep. things in our bodies. What what sort of things are you involved in? that really excite us? So, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Like, uh, the one of the kind of base, basic premises of the quantified self movement is you can't understand what you don't measure. And I, and I think this is really basic. I think most people in our lives are living in this sort of neutral or subconscious state day to day, just going through motions. And what I really, really love about the IoT movement or the Internet of Things, which is what we work on every day, is we can start showing you the data about your life. So one of the things that I always love is when you see the light bulb go off for someone that's never ever measured their sleep before, but has always felt tired. Mm. But in their head, they tell themselves, well, I know I'm going to bed early. And then they start actually tracking with an app on their iPhone or whatever it is. And what they learn first is not what it means to be in deep sleep or light sleep or how many times you toss and turn or any of that. They just realize that they're actually not going to bed as early as they think, and that's all that really matters. Is something as simple as that changes profoundly the foundation of health for that person because just downloading an app today, you can download any of them, Sleep Cycle, Sleep.io, you name it, there's so many of them, and just start tracking your sleep tonight. And within a couple of days, you'll realize that you think you're going to bed by 11 o'clock or midnight, you're going to bed at one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning, and then you're having to wake up at 6.30 or seven. No shit, that's why you're tired. <laughs> like, and so this is just something that these small little things that we can do in the world by connecting the physical world and showing that information back to people has a profound impact and can be really literally almost overnight. Now, that's on the health side. So for, for me, uh, I've been pretty on my high horse about that for a long time. We have over half of our investments 
are in the uh, health tech or med tech space at Brink. Now, uh, something I'm really into now and something that we're looking into uh, in our, we actually made two investments in our drone program and just made one through our IoT accelerator is agricultural technology. So mm-hmm. I always had this idea that, well, uh, let's say I get all this data about myself and, and there's nothing I can do with it. I'd rather say that I try because hopefully we're improving the world and I can be healthy to live long enough to enjoy it. And then I realized that actually the next step that I wasn't paying attention to that's also really critical is that we're actually destroying the world that we need to survive. And so I started looking into water, plantation crops, uh, the food supply, like we're looking at shrimp, uh, beef, different types of things that we can help via connected technologies to improve the food and water supply or you know general agriculture, which is obviously even more important than quantifying my sleep. So hmm. um, that those are kind of the the two major areas that I'm personally really psyched about. And yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm seeing crazy stuff every day. Would those sort of technologies be relevant to places like Asia? Because I suppose the, the stereotype is that, you know, of the, the guy with the, you know, planting the, the rice paddy, right? Where mm. technology doesn't really sort of come into play because it's labor <laughs> intensive. That's the stereotype. What's the reality now when you talk about agritech, for example, is that, you it's know, so funny. I was just watching a YouTube video I shared with my head of my drone accelerator uh, last night. There's actually a, a team out of China that's created this drone that will fly and, and spray the right pesticides over rice plantations right. at a much, much, much uh, lower cost and a much higher percentage accuracy and, and yield than men could ever do or man could ever do. And uh, we're actually just made an investment into shrimp uh, technology. We're actually helping to increase the yield of shrimp farming, which uh, right now shrimp is around 4% of the world's food. Uh, and we think that we can increase it by at least 1% to 2%, which would be insane in terms of the actual impact on the world because right now there's so much loss in shrimp farming. Um, so it's, it might seem like these are just like, these are like people you've never met sitting in Jakarta on the outskirts, you know, in the, in the water or people, you know, in the rice plantations, like you said, in China, I I know, I think people think that because the worlds are more developing or there's lower income levels that this doesn't apply. I think it's exactly the opposite. Hmm. It's exactly why we're going to be able to increase their efficiencies and yields, help them actually come up into the middle class and at the same time produce a more effective world. So I, I think that ultimately these technologies can actually be had or actually can have a lot bigger impact when you look at the developing world and just buying, let's say, the next Apple Watch. And how are things like equity crowdfunding affecting hardware startups? Is that a big factor for you at the moment? Um, we've had a couple of teams do it so far. Um, I think it's it's very new. I mean, ultimately, you know, I, I'm very close friends with the Kickstarter team, the Indiegogo team. I, I ultimately have told everyone, like my personal opinion is that anything that we can do to mm. decrease the barrier to gain capital for good ideas is beneficial for the world. Like, and, and it's not without its problems and challenges as we've seen in crowdfunding. But I really do think that equity crowdfunding is a very complex uh, and challenging way to fund businesses. A couple of our teams have benefited from that, which I feel good about because we're ensuring the risk on those teams. But I think uh, the only thing I worry about on that side is for the, let's say one of the jokes I always hear is like, there's this dentist that has an extra $5,000 a year and wants to invest and that should be going into savings. But now they have this like new twinkle in their eye because being an investor sounds cool. And they don't understand that, you know, if the stock market is risky, investing in, you know, startups is a hundred times riskier, maybe a thousand times riskier. So I just want to make sure that people have the right information. Um, But I think ultimately leveling the playing field and getting capital to good ideas is profoundly important for the world. Okay, let's talk about risk then, because you are a risk taker. You've taken some calculated risks in your career. Um, Some of them have paid off. Some haven't, obviously, but that's part of the, the learning process, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you come from, I mean, originally from the East Coast, but, you know, you schooled in your, in the technology world in the West Coast, working for a yep. company like Apple, you were exposed to a lot of risk. Risk was embedded in the culture there hmm. that, you know, that's almost like the default position. And now yeah. you're in Asia. And I think people need to understand that there's a different appetite for risk there as well. Have you felt anything tangibly different moving from, San Francisco to Hong Kong in terms of people's attitude to risk? Because, you know, back in San Francisco, it's like, okay, you failed, start another business. Yep. A little bit different here in Asia, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, and I, I bet everyone in the audience, like the vast majority of people, 
uh, do not grow up in lifestyles or ho- households where risk is, is like the, the default position, like you said, and, and neither did I. I mean, I grew up in the East Coast, very blue collar. Every man in my family was a military man. Every woman was a teacher, right. period. It was very blue collar, very, very risk low averse, risk. Yeah. very low risk, right? Like penny stocks, you know, buy <laughs> one house, like, you know, that kind of thing. Seriously, that, that's, that's what it was. And so I was not in an environment where risk was expected or normal. I was very much an oddball in the way I looked at my life. You know, you can take you, – probably when you realize you've broken your arm six times by the time you're 15, like – you generally kind of get a sense like you're a little different <laughs> than like <laughs> the people around you. Like you just kind of like you don't see the world the same way. So for me, going to California was kind of felt like home for me. So it was actually I kind of felt out of place on the East Coast. But now moving to Asia, I've realized that you're completely right. I mean, the, the attitude around risk is completely different because they build empires in Asia. Families become Fortune 500 businesses. Yeah. And it's a very different mentality where they know that by building a building or by, you know, buying property or whatever that they've done forever, get buying another, you know, manufacturing plant. That these are very, very predictable investments. So the whole uh, startup culture is quite different over here because people have to fight tooth and nail to find money. And it's actually a funny uh, comment that we or way that we uh, categorize startups out here is we're looking for the cockroach startups. And mm. that's funny if you've been here because you know there's actually lots of cockroaches around the streets. But it's uh, – I mean it's not that disgusting. It sounds grosser than it is. But um, I think <laughs> it's more of this mentality that if you can make a startup survive and find the capital and win in Asia, you are going to crush the oh. West. Like it is so hard to get people to give you a dollar out here that if you can find something that gets people to open those wallets and give you the capital from investors, angels, high net worth individuals, family offices, whoever, then you're in good, good, good shape when you go west. Isn't that interesting? The, the flip side of that may be then some of the startups that are successful back in the west, quote unquote, not necessarily successful by virtue of having a great product or having a great marketing strategy, right? So I'm trying to uh, I'm trying Uber, carefully. Uber versus <laughs> DD, right? This is the greatest example of Uber having to lick its wounds and walk out of China. Yeah. Do, do you find that, I mean, when you have uh, founders come to you, uh, I know founders is a word which carries a lot of connotations as well, but we'll talk about that. But when founders come to you at Brink, that, you know, you have to kind of deprogram some of that attitude to risk or, you know, maybe a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, how does that, how do you actually do that? Cause I often find that something you can't teach easily. Yeah. We've actually, we've had to pivot quite a bit because when we're talking about hardware, like, I mean, hardware is not in uh, application 10 times harder than software. It is an attitude a hundred times harder. Hmm. And because Westerners were just programmed that things are easier than they really are. And that you can be a little less detail oriented or that because you can calculate it on your spreadsheet, it should work this way, which is not how it works. As we said earlier, it's all about relationships and getting out of the, out of the office and actually building the, the physical relationships needed to actually build a company in, in Asia. But I think uh, when, you, when you look at uh, the kind of founders that come here first, we've tried to control that and, and through the due diligence process, through our material uh, but ultimately you're completely right. Like we actually, you know, messed this up pretty sorely in the first couple of batches because right. we just were trying to control and then we tried to fear monger and that didn't work. And we're like, damn it. Like, how do we just explain that building a physical business or building a business in Asia is fucking different? Stop telling me what you read on TechCrunch. Stop telling me what mm-hmm. Y Combinator is putting in the press. It doesn't fucking work here. And so we have 110 years experience in mainland China, 54 years in the Middle East, 38 years in India. Like we know this world. And so we finally actually created a different architecture to our program where we have uh, a one month trial program in our equity programs that allow founders and us to work together for a month because maybe everything's great during the due diligence, the pitching and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, if we don't think a founder showing up at the 50 yard line every day, we're done. Right. And 
we, we had to do this because we're like, man, we love this product idea. We love the founder. We love the pitch, everything else. And then when it comes to the day-to-day work that it takes to build this, after a month of them showing up or not showing up, you know really clearly whether they have what it takes or not, whether they understand the seriousness and the energy that it's going to take to build a successful company. And if they don't, we want to get out as soon as possible. And mm. so we, we've created this new one month, uh, we call it the ramp up sprint. And really it's like, look, show us or don't show us. But if you don't, we're done. So compared to an accelerator or an incubator program in California, would that attitude towards you know work ethic be slightly different? Would they, would they impress upon the founders the need to show up every day? I'm just wondering how, because you said you learned something in this process and you were doing it differently. So maybe you're carrying a kind of baggage from what you knew before. You, a ton. This is actually, so our head of programs, Hillary, um, she used to run seed camp all across Europe, which is the largest accelerator yeah. group in Europe. And we, uh, we had a lot of arguments about this because I've known her for many years, like since 2008 or 2009. So this is one of the biggest things that we've done is we've done the 180 degree polar opposite version of acceleration than what the West does because we've learned all that. And there's not, it's not all wrong. I think it potentially, you know, in their, in their local markets may make sense, but we have done everything in our power to flip it on the head. I mean, from the uh, the way that we do it, it's we do a lot of remote acceleration because it doesn't make sense for teams to leave their home markets and spend all that money and time and energy. We don't see the benefit in it. We see uh, if we do it, it's, it's for a small duration, not the whole program. We have a lot of teams that you know this whole one month ramp up. They're like, I don't really get it. It's like you will get it, trust me. And then they see the work and they're like, oh, like maybe I don't want to be a founder. Maybe I'm not <laughs> taking this seriously enough. Or or even when it comes down to like later stage like when it comes to like actually manufacturing your product you know they think that because they heard one guy do a thing and they saw something on crowdfunding and apple makes stuff so perfectly like they really underestimate how critical it is to build business plans and financial models so that you even have a chance at maybe yeah. making something correct in the future and this is just a very very different way uh than i think the western programs work or or even using mentors that's a huge one we do the work ourselves we don't have mentors that's hmm. such a like complete difference like wait a second i'm going to outsource the things that we know intimately and we do every single day there's some guy that you have to pick off a list and you have an hour meeting with him and then he completely gives you some random information that changes the entire programming like well, you must be joking right like we we have very 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 senior uh executives and founders that have launched and exited the most the biggest names you've heard of in the physical and iot worlds that if there's a particular moment we can bring them in but these are the most badass people you've ever met and we're only using 30 minutes of their time or something um because we think that we have to do the work with the founders we don't outsource that work to mentors so that would traditionally be the role of a mentor to go in and sit with a, a startup for a number of hours a week or a month but you're saying you, you want to get a lot more hands on because you want to make sure that the kind of advice that they're getting matches or syncs up with the advice or the whole philosophy of your accelerator, right? Whereas, you know, a mentor may just come in and just offer some random advice. Not saying all mentors are like that, but you know, they're not necessarily on the program, so to speak. Well, you either have or have not built a physical company before. <laughs> like right. if, if a mentor walks in and says, I've been shipping, you know, 200,000 pieces a year of this table for the last five years, I would take that mentor any day over some connected digital yeah. blah, blah, blah person from the Valley that's never shipped a physical product every, like every single time. No doubt, no competition. Hey, look, before we uh, finish up, would you be able to give us a heads up on maybe a device or a piece of hardware that's coming to the market that's public that we should check out just as an example of what's out there at the moment? It could be something that part of your accelerator or associated with your scheme or anything associated with the projects you're involved in, just so we can get a feel for what's coming up. Sure. Uh, one, of, one of our teams that's about to launch is called Silent Mode. Um, I would definitely check these guys out. They're, they're from Hong Kong, badass founders, and they're helping us take these small breaks throughout our days, not naps, not like the Valley where you have nap pods and sleeping <laughs> breaks and all this stuff. It's these like quick power breaks uh, where they, they have a whole science behind it and, and love, love, love these guys. Can't wait to get my, my prototype. Um, they, they're, very, they're very close to launching in the next you know, four to six weeks. But I, I also think there's some really interesting technologies that if anyone's really interested in that quantified self-movement, um, just pay attention to this. We're about to move from 
where we are in the wearable category, which I know a lot of people have feelings about, you know, the, it's still a major category, of like let's say wristbound wearables. We're about to get to this microdermal level, which all that means is that you would wear, let's say, a patch, mm. and it has about 300 to 400 microdermal, microdermal needles in it, which you wouldn't barely feel. It feels like sandpaper, right? It's not like a real needle. But we're about to get to the point where we can start measuring our bio materials in our bodies in near real time which is going to start unlocking our ability to solve health challenges that have been plaguing humanity for all of time. Like this is, this is about to change on the health side very rapidly. And I think a lot of people don't understand how important it is to start creating their own data sets on their own bodies and their own health and their own environment so that when these breakthroughs come, which are very, very in the near term, that they can benefit and live happier and healthier lives. So I really, really implore people to just be a little bit more conscious, track a little bit more, learn a little bit more about your health every day because we're on a precipice of actually solving these health issues that have been plaguing generations. And, mm. and you want to be able to be put in yourself in a position to benefit from these advances in science. That's Bay McLaughlin, everybody, co-founder of Brink, a man who has a self described passion for hardware i think that comes through in spades in this interview it's fantastic it's great having you on the show babe before you go before we let you go you've got to give us some links where we can go and find out more about you and the projects you're involved in oh yeah no, number one best thing to check me out is on twitter i'm just at beta bay uh would love 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 to connect one thing that i promise to do uh, I've learned and had access to so many smart people in my life, and I feel so fortunate for that. Um, I will literally answer every single question. If you hit me on Twitter or my whale page, which is linked to my Twitter, or on my YouTube page uh, at Ask Beta Bay, I will absolutely answer every single question because the least I can do is try to you know, give back what people have taught me. So if you hit me up on Twitter, I promise you I'll, I'll respond. Fantastic. And we'll put all the details in the show notes. Bay, been a real pleasure having you on the show today. And I want you to come back on in the future as well, because you are in a very fast moving space. And like some of the heads up that you gave us today about the, the hardware launches coming out, not just uh, silent mode was a good one. We'll put details in the show notes as well, but also that the dermal side of things. I mean, we're just like, unlocking a new avenue really for health tech and where we go with that is just going to be fascinating. So really excited about getting you back on in future as well and give us an update yeah. on what's the latest in your world Bay McLaughlin everybody Bay thanks so much for joining us on the show today thank you so much for having me you've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com